Okay, good morning everyone. We are continuing here in our studies of Tehillim. And we find ourselves in Samich Beis number 62. And we, I believe, are on Pasig Vav, which is verse number 6. And again, David HaMelech is, continues to drive home this point that suffering in a person's life is a good thing, it's not a bad thing. Challenges, you know, when we were kids, they told us it will toughen us up. But, but in reality, what David says over here is that if a person wants resilience, if they want closeness to Elohim, if they want to live a more exalted and a lofty and a more spiritual life, so then the only way to really accomplish that is by having to go through the difficulties that we have in this world. And the more that a person endures, and the makabal they accept it, and they go through with a moon and bitach, and they believe and they trust in Hashem, and they utilize that which they are going through in order to find new pathways in their relationship with our Kodesh Baruch Hu. So then the pain that Hashem causes to the person is not a pain of destruction, it's not a pain of anger, it's not a pain of HaKadosh Baruch getting back at a person. Rather, as we saw, and we will continue to see in these Mepharshim in, in today's Tilim, that is actually loving kindness that HaKadosh Baruch is showering upon a person, helping them and allowing them to reach levels that perhaps, not perhaps, that certainly they would not have been able to achieve any other way. So in verse 6, it says, Ach le'elokim daimi nafshi. My soul is only silent to you, Hashem. Ki mimenu tigvasi, because my hope comes from Him. Says David, I only am serving the Rebbeinu She'olam. I'm not going to complain against HaKadosh Baruch Hu because all of my hope is coming from Him. And the seventh verse, Achut Suri Yeshuasi, only Hashem is my rock and my salvation. Mizgabi, my high tower. Loi Emoi, I will certainly not be swayed. And David writes over here, uh, the, Rav Hirsch writes over here the following idea. No matter how severe and stern the judgment of Hashem's decrees seems to me, no matter how harsh the trials are, that HaKadosh Baruch Hu Elohim, remember Elohim is the name of God, which is Midas Hadin, it's the attribute of judgment. And I see that Hashem has ordained tremendous judgment for me. Nevertheless, He still remains the sole source from which I shall derive and maintain peace of mind for today and my hope for tomorrow. And any attempt to sway me from my firm conviction, conviction shall be in vain. David HaMelech, the master of Amun and Bitochen, who looked at everything that came his way as a message directly from Hashem, he understood, as we're going to see, that if the Rebbeinu She'olam is putting me through this thing, the reason is, is that he wants me to get closer to him. And HaKadosh Baruch Hu, even though that you are hidden, and even though that you seem distant, and even though that the judgments that you're making upon me seem harsh to be able to handle and deal with sometimes, I still recognize that wherever my menucha, my peace of mind and my tranquility is coming from, it's only coming from you. And if the enemies rise up against me and they try to convince me otherwise, I'm not going to listen to them. It says Rav Hirsch, not only says David that he's not going to be swayed, swayed from his amunah in a great degree, but David is affirming his belief in HaKadosh Baruch, and he's saying, I'm not going to be swayed at all. You're not going to budge me. Nobody's going to, you know, sometimes when a person's going through difficult times, you have those naysayers, oh, really, Hashem really loves you, He really cares about you. Why is He doing this? Why is He doing that? And sometimes it's the voices that are in your head. Why did Hashem do this to me? Why did HaKadosh Baruch Hu do that to me? Why did Hashem make it like this? Says David HaMelech, I am not listening to any of the naysayers of this world. 
not the people that are around me that are lacking real emunah b'Hakadosh Baruch Hu, nor am I. We lost each other here. N- nor, hold on a moment. We have a faith in Hakadosh Baruch Hu is going to bring back the screen. Hold on one second. So, so David Amelch says to Hakadosh Baruch Hu, says to the says to Hashem. And he's really making his words known to the people that are around him. You can try and you can say negative, negative things about HaKadosh Baruch Hu. And you can try to make me believe that Hashem doesn't really love me and He doesn't really care about me and Hashem is upset with me and He's doing all these terrible things. But all of my trust and all of my hope is only in the Rebbe Nisha'ilam. And I trust that HaKadosh Baruch Hu puts me through things in my life because He demands more of me and he's like pressing me down to be able to bring out the, the beautiful juices of ruchnis that I have inside of myself. So Rev Hirsch continues and he writes the following idea. And that is that Le'elokim doimi nafshi to Elokim, which is the God of judgment. My soul is silent, which means my soul is directed towards Hashem. Because the, in, in the endeavor of man's spirit, to come close to Hashem is what life is all about. Every single moment of our lives, every single situation that we go through, everything that HaKadosh Baruch Hu puts us through is for one reason and one reason only, and that is to bring me closer to Hashem. And that's what HaKadosh Baruch Hu wants. Hashem is our Father. Hashem loves us. Chaviv, Yisrael, we are beloved in the eyes of the Rebbein Shalom. He wants to bring us close. So how can it be then that when Hashem is afflicting us, He wants to bring us close? The answer is because through the suffering and the affliction and the difficulties and the challenges and the tests that a person will go through, if we keep our mind's eye in the right place and we continue to think about the Rebbein Shalom, and we recognize it's all Mi'eis Hashem, it's all from Hashem, He loves us, He cares about us, He wants us, then a person is going to be able to utilize those situations in their life to get closer. Mimenu tikvasi, says David, from him is my tikva, is my hope, which means that he already fulfilled my hope, which I hold on to, and the mere fact that I'm still capable of feeling hope at all is assurance to me that even in the midst of my present affliction, Hashem is very near. Which means David Amal is saying, I might not see the, the light at the end of the tunnel right now. I might not see why everything that's going on is really the best thing in the world. But if I still have a tikva, I still have a hope, and I trust in HaKadosh Baruch, and I hope towards Hashem that things are going to get better, and I actually believe that inside of me, that itself is a sign, says David Amalekh, that HaKadosh Baruch Hu is very near to me. Kave El Hashem. Like David says elsewhere, hope to the Rebbein HaShoylam. Chazek v'amitz libecha, strengthen your heart. The Kave El Hashem, never stop trusting in the Rebbein HaShoylam and believing in HaKadosh Baruch Hu and hoping that Hashem is going to turn things over. And says David, if you have that inside your heart, you have that feeling, and that's what he's saying, I have this feeling, so that itself is already means that I'm in a place where the enemies have not gotten me down, they have not wiped me off this earth, and they have not hurt my amuna, and they did not hurt my bitachin. A one iota, one ki is that because I continue to believe and trust only in the Rebbein Nishan. Like the Malbim writes over here, Tigvasi Ela Yeshua Himimeno, my hope is that the salvation is going to come from the Rebbein Nisha'ilam. I don't trust in people, I don't trust in things to happen, I don't trust in unusual, I trust in Hashem. And a person who lives with that trust and that hope in HaKadosh Baruch Hu, no matter where they are and what is going on in their life, they're always, they're always going to be close and they'll have that relationship to the Rebbein Nisha'ilam. Al Elohim Yishi, my my salvation comes from Hashem, Uchvaydi, and my glory comes from Hashem. Tzor Uzi Machsi Belokim, the rock of my fortitude and my refuge 
is is Elohim. Remember, Elohim is Midas Hadin. Hadavid HaMelech is saying, even when HaKadosh Baruch Hu is seemingly not making such nice faces at us, when he's doing things that are difficult to understand, HaKadosh Baruch Hu, you are my fortitude. Al Elohim says, Rav Hirsch, that Al is a language of old, which means he's going up. Davra Melech is rising in his spiritual heights. Hashem's clomping him down. The enemies are surrounding him. He's got a lot of difficulties that are going on in his life. And nevertheless, he keeps ascending higher and higher and higher and higher, which is the goal of every single Jew. That our life is a life of ascension. Our life is a life of growth. It's not a life of stag- stagnity, if that's such a word. It's not a life of going down. It is a, not a life of plateauing. You don't plateau in Ruchnius. Life of Ruchnius, of spirituality, of belief, of close to Hashem is a world where you're continually going up and up and up. And David is saying, Al Elohim. I'm rising higher to be with HaKadosh Baruch Hu. And he says that it's mounting exaltation towards Hashem, which David attains upon the wings of inspiration of song. And we pointed this out many times throughout the Hillim. David HaMelech should be crying. He should be wailing. He should bury himself in his pillow at night and cry himself to sleep. He should get angry and frustrated and he should... He should be cursing out the people that are all around him. He should be getting angry with the Rebbeinu Sha'ilam. Or at least if he wants to have a niggin, it should be a dirge of sorrow and depression. But that's not David HaMelech's Moedis Aparende. That's not the way that he works. David HaMelech is a man of Amuna. He's a man of Bitochen. He trusts in the Rebbeinu Sha'ilam. And therefore he recognized that everything that HaKadosh Baruch Hu does in his life is just to bring me closer. So I'll sing songs, spirited songs of simcha, or songs of joy, mizmor lidavid, lidavid mizmor. He keeps singing and mizmor shir. He keeps singing song after song. Why? Because as he gets elevated in his closest to HaKadosh Baruch Hu, and the neshama gravitates more and more towards the Rebbein Nishaylam, so then it brings out the natural song that is inside each and every one of us. Your, your neshama has a niggin. Your soul has a song in and of itself. Sometimes you're walking around and you find yourself humming. You're singing a song. You didn't even know where it came from. That's the niggin that's in your neshama. That's the song that is there. That's a song of joy. A song of understanding what it means to be close to HaKadosh Baruch Hu. And that's something that David HaMelech teaches us. That when the tough get go, when the, when the going gets tough, the tough gets singing. That's what we do. We sing to the Rebbein Nishayim. We praise HaKadosh Baruch for all that He has done. We don't get despondent and break ourselves down and get angry with Hashem for what He's done. On the other hand, we realize it's all part of the plan that we should be able to bring ourselves closer. And He says like this, that all of my hopes, they still rest with Hashem. Even though that He decreed misfortunes, and now they're befalling me, says David HaMelech, but my, my fortunes may seem low at the present. And my good name has been maligned, meaning people were saying nasty things about David HaMelech. You know, one person speaks Lush and R about you, you're devastated. Imagine being the king of Claudiusville, being the most public figure of the nation, and you have hundreds if not thousands of people that are saying nasty things about you, and you're the biggest tzaddik in the world. Never the mind, never the less. I continue to find my happiness together with him, with the Rebbeinu Shalom, knowing and sensing that I'm very near to him even now, even now, when I'm in distress and when people are, are rising up against me and I've got embarrassments beyond belief, even now, I know you, HaKadosh Baruch Hu, you are, I am connected to you and you are with me. And that's what it means that this language of Yishi, which is like salvation, it's the feeling that I will live on strong and unbowed 
And Kivaydi is the awareness of my own spiritual and moral worth. I know that just because things are not going well, quote unquote, going, not going well, it doesn't take away or diminish my spiritual state. It doesn't diminish the koiches, the potential that I have inside. Ad the Rabbi, on the other hand, says David HaMelech, everything that you place me through, everything that you put me through, it's making me the person that I am. It's creating a new David HaMelech, a super David HaMelech 2.0, supercharged with, with energies and powers and abilities and closer to HaKadosh Baruch Hu that I never knew about before. And therefore he writes the following, and this is a powerful idea that Rav, Hirsch, that Rav Hirsch drives home. The firmness of my fortitude, which gives me confidence in the future, rests solely in Hashem. Listen to what he writes over here. Men, in their limited understanding, they think that in all of my misery I should feel that Hashem has abandoned me. That's how it looks. Look what David is going through. Everybody's looking at him and saying, are you, you believe in HaKadosh Baruch Hu? You should be a miserable wretch. If you're really his chosen, and he chose you as the king, and he wants you to run Klal Yisrael, and he wants you to fight the battles, and he wants you to be the holiest of all Jews, why does he keep doing all these things to you? I mean, if I were you, so I would be pretty miserable at this point. I'm such a, you're such a holy Jew, and yet HaKadosh Baruch Hu claps you again and again and again. But nevertheless, I know that whatever moral strength and fortitude I may have, I owe solely to the suffering which Hashem, Midas Hadin Elohim, has decreed for me in order to judge, to try, and discipline me. I don't look at the hardships that I'm going through as a negative response to my Kodesh Baruch Hu, on the other hand, says David HaMelech, I look at everything that HaKadosh Baruch is bringing me is the way in which Hashem is testing me, the way that He is shaping me and molding me, the way that HaKadosh Baruch is elevating me because He wants me closer to Him. And he writes, such fortitude and moral steadfastness cannot be attained by Him who has never known a moment's sorrow. If someone lives a peachy keen life and everything goes gewaldic all the time, every day of his life, 120 years, peaceful, bliss, no challenges, good, money coming in, health was good, children were nachas, marriage, everything was amazing all day long. That's how it was. This person would have no moral strength and he would have no fortitude and he would have no inner strength of even knowing who he is. It's only because that HaKadosh Baruch Hu will place a person through things in their life that hurts sometimes, that pains the person, that tests the person in ways that they never thought they could handle and endure before. That's what makes me resilient. That's what makes me strong. And then the next time that HaKadosh Baruch Hu sends something my way, what ends up happening? I'm prepared in advance. I'm ready to overcome the challenge that HaKadosh Baruch Hu has put me through. I'll respond immediately in the positive before I allow the negativity to consume me. I'll bring myself closer to the Rebbein Nishoylam without Hashem having to pummel me again and again and again because I find solace in the Rebbein Nishoylam. I find comfort in HaKadosh Baruch Hu. I find protection in the Rebbein Nishoylam. And therefore, because that HaKadosh Baruch Hu put me through the sorrows of life, He gave me challenges that maybe didn't give to anybody else that I know. That's all what's the thing that is going to bring me closer and closer and allow me to overcome whatever it is that HaKadosh Baruch Hu does. There is a very powerful Misa. It could be that I told this previously, but I think it's been a while since I told over this story. I mentioned a few weeks ago, Rav Shimon Russell, the very famous psychotherapist 
of Klal Yisrael today, who has become one of the biggest experts in chinuch and raising children, and his specialty is dealing with children that are off the derech, that unfortunately are in such pain and crisis that they have left the ways of Yiddishkeit. And he, he addresses those children and their families, and he's made it his mission to try to heal the pain of Klal Yisrael and bring families back together to the best of his abilities. And he has tens of thousands, maybe even up to 100,000 parents across the world that are listening to his, to his advice and taking his, his words of wisdom to heart and transforming themselves, transforming their families, transforming the atmosphere in their house and the chinuch and the education to be able to raise the best and the most beautiful members of Klal Yisrael that is possible. So he tells over a story that took place probably, I think, maybe 20 years ago or so. There was a family, I believe it was in Lakewood, and the son in that family went off the derech, which again, 20 years ago was not as common as we find it today, and it was even more painful back then when a parent would see these things going on. And this young man was angry, and he was furious, and he was in pain, as many of these children are, and that's it, he, he gave up his Yiddishkeit. He was still living in the house, and it was very hard for the parents to try to balance him and the other kids in the family, not very easy. And one Friday night, so it's time for Kiddush, and they call to the room where their son is, he's already by this time, he's a Mechal Shabbos, doesn't keep Shabbos, but he's in the house, and it's Friday night, and they call him down to Kiddush. And he comes down, and he's wearing his jeans and his t-shirt, and he's got a scowl on his face. He's in a bad mood. He has no desire to be there, but his parents told him to come down, so he came down. And he's standing by the wall of the, of the dining room with his hands like this, and he's in a tough, imposing uh, position, and the father begins making Kiddush after he sang Shalom Aleichem Eishishcha, which the boy just sat there, didn't say a word. And the father begins making Kiddush and the boy's just looking with that mean look of hatred and disgust. And in the middle of the Kiddush, the boy goes over to the wall and he takes his elbow and on purpose he turns off the light on Shabbos in the dining room. The father lost it in the middle of Kiddush. He drops his cup and he begins chasing after his son, screaming and yelling, how dare you, how dare you, how dare you. The son is running around the table. The mother and the other siblings are watching the whole scene in front of them. They're in total, absolute shock. How could such a thing happen? They're trying to stop the son. They're trying to stop the father. Nothing until the son runs out of the house. And he finds in the yard a rake, a metal rake. And he goes to the windows on, of the house and he begins smashing one window after another, after another, after another. Total disaster, what chaos. And then he runs away. And the family is left in absolute shock and hysteria. The mother's crying, the children are crying, the father is, is brooding. And they find out after Shabbos that the son had run to one of his uncles who lived elsewhere in the neighborhood. And the uncle was in contact with the parents and he told them, we, I have your son, he's not coming home right now. And the parents at that time, they call Rabbi Russell and they explain and Rabbi Russell works with them to help them understand the psyche of a child, to understand what's going on, what he needs. And they tried to send messages every once in a while, but there was almost no communication for six months. After six months, the, the uncle that the son was staying by calls to Rabbi Russell. He knew that the parents were working with him, and he said, the boy would like to come home for his Shabbos. Could you arrange that with the parents? And so Rabbi Russell calls the parents in, and they, he sits down with them, and he explains to them, the boy is reaching out, he wants to come home for his Shabbos, but you have to be prepared, because he's still off the derech, and we don't know how he's going to behave. He might pull the same 
things that he did the last time. He might be Mechal Shabbos and on you. He might turn off the light in the middle of Kiddush. You must tell your, you must let me know that you're mentally prepared for whatever's going to go on at this point. And if you are prepared, and I'll coach you through till he comes, then I think it's Kedai, it's worthwhile that he comes home for Shabbos. And so the parents said, yes, we want. We feel that we're ready. And he coached the father and he said, just in case the same scene repeats itself and your son comes down to Kiddush in his jeans and his t-shirt and that scowl on his face and in the middle of your Kiddush he ends up turning off the light because he's testing you. He's going to test you to see what you do. You don't stop. You just keep making Kiddush as if nothing happened. And you pass out Kiddush to all of the children in the family, including your son afterwards. Don't make a comment at all, negative, about what happened. On the other hand, if you can find something nice to say, say something positive instead. So they send a message to the son that they will be delighted to have him come home for Shabbos. And sure enough, Friday afternoon, he comes home, jeans, t-shirt, looks a little less angry than he was perhaps the last time that he was there, but he's still by no means a Shoma Shabbos boy. He comes in and the father embraces him, the mother embraces him, the siblings are so excited to see him. It's like a, a king's welcome, a hero's welcome. And the father's getting ready to go to shul Friday night, and he knocks on the door and he says, Yitzi, would you like to come for davening? No, I'm fine, I'll stay home. Okay, fine, the father says, no problem. He goes to shul, he comes home. They sing Shalom Aleichem, they sing Eishas Chayel. Yitzi's still not there, they call him down. Yitzi, Yitzi, Kiddush. And the whole family's on eggshells. The last time that Yitzi was there for Kiddush, everybody remembers what happened. And he comes down, jeans, t-shirt, already by this time his pleasant face that he came home with is not looking so pleasant anymore. The scowl has returned and he's standing there once again like this, hands crossed over with an intense look. And he takes the same exact place against the wall that he was last time. And the father begins Kiddush, Yoy Mashishi, Vayichulu Hashemayim, Vars Vichol Tzavam. And Yitzi moves back a little bit towards the wall. And in the middle of the Kiddush, he once again takes his elbow, and he turns off the light. But this time, the father doesn't stop a minute. He just continues to say Kiddush. And at the end of Kiddush, he pours all the Kiddush, the wine, into the cups and he gives to his wife and to his children. And then he walks over to his son with a cup of grape juice in his hand and he says, Yitzi, if only I would have known then what I know now, things would have been so different. And at that moment he starts crying. And Yitzi starts crying. And the father and the son, for the first time in who knows how long, fall on each other in an embrace and they're heaving and crying. And the mother comes over and she joins them and she's crying and the sister and the brother and the next thing you know, the entire family's on the floor of that dining room, crying and crying and crying. And that was the night that the healing for Yitzi began. And it was a process, and it was a hall, a long haul. But eventually, he came back to Yiddishkeit. Eventually, he went off to Yeshiva, eventually became an Ehrlich, God-fearing Jew. And today he is married from the religious wife, beautiful from children, 
living a life that is a nachas ruach to the Rebbeinu Shailam, and a tremendous nachas ruach to his parents. Says David HaMelech, if you don't go through the sorrows of life, if you don't go through the difficulties of life, if you don't go through the challenges of life, how will you know what life is all about? How will you know to be a better person? How will you know to be a greater person? How will you know to lift yourself up and live with the Rebbein Nishayim? How will you know that? You never will. And therefore, instead of complaining, David HaMelech looked at his situation in life and he says, Thank you, Hashem. Thank you for the success and thank you for the failures. Thank you for the achievements and thank you for the challenges and the difficulties. Thank you for the happiness and thank you for the sadness because I know that everything that you are giving to me is all me, Baruch Hu, the one who loves me and he cares about me and he only wants to bring me close. And therefore, when a person will see things coming upon them that they didn't ask for and they didn't wish for, and it seems daunting and overwhelming. Recognize that HaKadosh Baruch Hu is doing it because He loves you. And He wants you closer to Him. And He wants you to become a greater person. He wants you to become elevated. He wants you to be someone that their Yiddishkeit and their Muna and their Bitochen is real. It's not just hypothetical. It's not intellectual. It's not in the books. I'm living with it. I'm living with the Rebbe Nishailam. And when a person understands and they see and they recognize that, sky's the limit on how close a person is actually going to get to the Rebbe Nishailam. Says this to Hillam further in verse test number nine Bidhu Voy Bechol Ace. Trust in Hashem at all times, not just when it's easy and it's convenient. Trust in HaKadosh Baruch Hu Bechol Eis all of the time. Am Shifchu Lifanov. Be a people, be a nation who pours out their hearts in front of Lifanov Levavachem, that they pour out their hearts in front of Elohim before Hashem. You are our refuge. You are our safe haven. You are that which is going to protect us. Says David Melech, you have nothing to worry about. Trust in HaKadosh Baruch Hu constantly. All the time. Pour out your hearts in tefillah in prayer, before Hashem. And then HaKadosh Baruch Hu, Mechase Lanu Sela, HaKadosh Baruch Hu, is going to be our source of refuge. Says Rav Hirsch, and then we'll see some of the other Mepharshim. David HaBelech wants people to understand that, that the conviction which has been taught to him in the school of suffering, that's what it is, a school of suffering. Is that trust in HaKadosh Baruch Hu Bechol Eis all of the time, that whatever HaKadosh Baruch Hu may bring you, whatever misfortune will befall a person, Shiv Chulafanov, pour out your heart to your best friend in the world, to the Rebbein Nishaylam, and realize that Hashem is the one that ordained everything for you. As we know, we look throughout Tanakh and we see that some of the greatest people in the history of the world were the ones that had the most difficult and painful lives. Because HaKadosh Baruch Hu is misavit filas and shel tzaddikim. He loves, he desires the tefillah of tzaddikim, the prayers of the righteous. And what should a person do? Pour out their heart at that time to HaKadosh Baruch Hu. We know that as we are approaching the story of the, the holiday of Purim, that Klai Yusuf was in bad shape. HaKadosh Baruch Hu decreed in Shemayim, Kalyu, which means we were supposed to be destroyed. There was going to be a holocaust that would smite 
every last Jew in the 127 provinces of Echashverosh. It would be a holocaust of massive proportions. And Yerach HaKadosh Baruch Hu, Nahafechu, he turned everything over. Why did Hashem turn everything over? So if anybody saw the Torah Avigdor, they saw the words of Rabbi Avigdor Miller this week that was sent out to all the shuls because they banded together as one and they fasted for three days and they poured out their hearts in a heartfelt filo where they asked the Rebbe save us, HaKadosh Baruch Hu, save us from our enemies, bring us Yeshua's and Nechama's salvations and comfort and consolations, make miracles for us, even though we're not worthy of it, that we should be the Amad Nivcha, the nation that you chose, and continue to live on. And as a result of Klal Yisrael, Shivchu Lefanam Levavachem, that they poured out their hearts before the Rebbe Nishayim, Eloikim HaMechaselonu HaKadosh Baruch Hu becomes our refuge. And Hashem turns everything around on Purim. And He makes the Holocaust against our enemies and we go into freedom and safety and peace and tranquility and simcha and rejoicing. Because when a Yid turns all of his energies to Hashem, because he recognizes that the only place in the world that my salvation will come from is the Rebbein HaShoylam. So then HaKadosh Baruch Hu will hear our tefillos, he will hear our cries, he will accept what we have to say, and Hashem, who Elohim HaKadosh Baruch Hu, the master of the universe, Elohim Midas Adin, he puts us through it, just to make us greater and bring us closer to Him. Every word of tefillah, every word of prayer brings us closer to Hashem. Every chizuk in Amun and Bitochem brings us closer to Hashem. Every kabbalis, yisurim, every time that we accept upon ourselves the hardships and the suffering that Hashem gives us, it brings us closer to Him. It illuminates the darkness that a person can find themselves in. By seeing the light of the Rebbe Nishayim, the light of his Amuna, the light of Bitochen, the light of goodness and the Chesed of Hashem. And therefore, says David, Al Tidag, don't worry. Whatever HaKadosh Baruch is sending, it's all for the good. And Hashem is Machas Elonu, he becomes our refuge. You'll be protected by Hashem. Says Rav Gamliel Rabbanovich, Yesh Levayaderech Remez, I can explain this verse in a, in a Remez with a hint. David is teaching Klal Yisrael. You have to trust in HaKadosh Baruch Hu all of the time. Because there's no second during the day. Shall Adam. There's not a single second in one's life that a person doesn't need bitachin, trust in Hashem, to be able to survive. And if you don't strengthen yourself in this midah called bitachin, I trust in you Hashem, I trust in you Hashem, I trust in you Hashem, you will not be able to survive for even a moment. Without bitachin, how could you survive? What is one of the ways that we could merit to be filled with the midah, the trait of bitachin, of trusting in Hashem? What the advice that David is giving us is, Pour out your hearts in front of Hashem. It means simple folk like us. Pasha the people, simple people. Af Adam even, even if you're not on a high level of bitachin, you struggle with your bitachin. You struggle with your belief. You struggle in seeing the good in everything that's going on. You struggle with it. Pour out your heart to Hashem. And you dive in to please HaKadosh Baruch Hu. Let me be zeicher. Let me merit to be more of a master of the Midah Bitochen. The Al Yideshi is Palo Yischayim Boy. And through davening for Bitochen, 
you'll get bitachin. Elokim echasel on his cell, that's what it means, Hashem becomes our refuge. Yizkeh lemidus habitachin, when HaKadosh Baruch is your refuge, which means that you are in the loving embrace of Hashem, He's protecting you, He's shielding you. That means you achieve bitachin. How do you get there? Davin for bitachin. You need something, we think that we can only ask for the physical, material things that we need. You need money, you daven for money. You need a shirach, you daven for a shirach. You want children, you daven for children. You want success, you daven for success. What about in ruchnius? What about in spiritual matters? You got to daven for success in that as well. You need more amun and bitachin, daven to HaKadosh Baruch You need to strengthen and bitachin so that you have the trust in everything that's going on. You'll believe in the Rebbein Hashem and you'll realize that HaKadosh Baruch is taking care of everything, then you need to daven to Hashem for such a thing. And therefore, says David HaMelech over here, and that's what Rav Gamliel Rabbanovich is saying, David's understanding of the reason why HaKadosh Baruch Hu puts a person through what he puts him through is because he put me into that situation that I will shivcho, that I'll shivcho the fun of levavachem, that I'll pour out my heart in front of you, Hashem. And when a person does that, they're reaching the closeness, they're reaching the bond, they're reaching the love that the neshama is searching for. Says the Malbim on these on these words, bidchu am, atem am bidchu Hashem. You are a nation that trusts in Hashem. Obviously, says the, the Malbim, it's much more advisable for a person to trust in HaKadosh Baruch Hu than to trust in anybody or anything else. Number one, because if a person puts their trust and their faith in human beings, you can't trust in that person all the time. Because when this guy is having a hard day, this guy just lost, you know, you have certain people you rely upon for parnasa, for money, a doctor to heal you. Or what if the guy just lost $45 million in some Ponzi scheme? He has no money left. He's not going to help you in parnasa. What about the doctor who just ended up losing his license because he did something shady in, in some area of his, of his practice and now he can't do the, the brain surgery that you need? You can't rely on people. They are not. They are not. They are not reliable because they always have different things that are going on. When he wakes up in a bad mood, he's having a bad day. How can you rely upon him? He's going to take care of the best of you. Hashem doesn't wake up on the wrong side of the bed. Hashem doesn't have a bad day. Now you might not be happy with what Hakadosh Baruch Hu does to you, but Hashem's not having a bad day. And therefore, don't trust in people. Trust only in Hashem. Trust in Hashem always. When you trust in people, you can't, you're not revealed to that person all the deep recesses that are going on inside of your heart, everything that you really need. You have certain things you're embarrassed to share with them. You need something. I don't want to tell them what I need. It's embarrassing. You really need their help. I'm too embarrassed to ask them. However, when it comes to HaKadosh Baruch Hu, pour out your heart. You can reveal all of the secrets that are in your heart to the Rebbein Nishayim. Whatever you need, whatever you are lacking, whatever you are missing in your life, whatever you really feel is something that is a necessity for your happiness, for your joy, for your tranquility. You wouldn't tell anybody else about it, but HaKadosh Baruch Hu, you'll tell. You have nothing to be embarrassed of. Pour out your heart to Hashem. Shalokim mechaselonu, Hashem becomes our refuge. Sheba'odam rak yiftach, you should trust only in Hashem. I'm sorry. When it comes to trusting in a human being, all you can do is trust in the human being. But he'll never be more than just trust that you can have in him. And even there, the Malbim is saying, don't even put your trust in men because they're unreliable. However, but when you put your bitachin in the Rebbein Shalom and you put all your trust in Hashem, becomes your refuge. 
כמו שכוסוב תואב לאכזייס בהשם מבטוח באדם, like it says elsewhere in Dillon, better to trust in HaKadosh Baruch Hu, than to, or to hope in Hashem, than to trust in man, like it says, sell or see him, because trusting in Hashem will make HaKadosh Baruch Hu your refuge. He cares for you. He takes care of you. He protects you. He guards you. A human being has great limitations in his life. When, when things are good and he's the, got all the power, yes, it's true that there's more that he can do for you. But it's not going to remain like that forever. No person has stellar success for 120 years. And if you rely upon them, you're relying upon a person himself who is unreliable. But if you rely upon HaKadosh Baruch Hu, who is the most reliable of all, then you have the bracha that David is saying over here. And that is that Hashem becomes machasa, HaKadosh Baruch becomes your refuge. He becomes your safe haven. He becomes your protective shield and force. Because HaKadosh Baruch Hu is right there together with you. So I, I want to leave you off with a maisa just to understand just how far-reaching the amuna and the bitachin is that a person can have, and how, how this works in the world. I saw this story recently. I'm sure that I'll share it one day in shul, most likely, but I'll share it with you. You heard it here first. And there was a fellow in New Jersey in the congregation, I believe is the congregation of, of Ron Yitzchak Rabbi Eisenman in Passaic, New Jersey. His name was Bernard Hillstein, and he could no longer live alone. And so he had no choice. He had to enter into a facility of assisted living. Now, he lived in New Jersey. It's cold in Jersey. Almost as cold as it is here in Los Angeles. And he always craved to be in a place where there was warmer weather. And he was very excited that he found in Florida, there was a Shoma Shabbos assisted living place with a shul right inside, kosher, everything. And he hurriedly assigned, he, he signed the lease immediately. After he made the deposit, and the deposit was cashed, he noticed the fine, and he also gave up his lease on his apartment, he noticed in the fine print that the following words, and that is that no dogs or pets allowed. Now, why was this so bad for a fru man coming from Passaic, New Jersey, because Bernie had a wife named Ethel who had passed away six years previously. And he was all alone. And in order to have some companionship, after his wife of 56 years passed away, he welcomed a German shepherd into his house by the name of Oakley. And it was a service guide dog to help him get around on his own. And Oakley and Bernie, they became constant companions of each other. And truth be told, if it wouldn't have been for Oakley, his dog, what would he have done during COVID? Oakley kept him company. And Ethel and him had no children. And as his eyesight was failing, so without Oakley in the apartment, he would have had nothing. Lone, total loneliness. And this dog was the source of his comfort, of his companionship, of helping him get around the streets and going to where he had to go. So when Bernie noticed in the fine print, no pets allowed, he asked himself, how in the world am I going to be able to survive in such a place? So he came to the, he came to the rabbi, Rabbi Eisenman, and he asked could he please get some rabbinical waiver that he's in a situation where he needs to have pets? So he said, I, so Rabbi Eisman said, he listened to what Bernie had to say. He understood the severity of the situation and he knew that he needs this animal to be, this dog to be together with him. And so the rabbi calls the facility in Miami, in Florida, and he begins speaking to them. And they listened very politely, but they told him under no circumstances do we allow pets or exceptions or waivers in this facility? So then he calls the rabbi, the chaplain of the facility. And he explained the same thing. My hands are tied. What do you want from me? That's from the powers, the higher powers above. 
Nobody had any authority to give Bernie the permission to bring Oakley in. Now, Bernie was beside himself, obviously. How's he going to end up living over here without, it, without his dog? And he gave up his apartment in New Jersey, and he already signed a lease in Florida. He said, so I called one more time, says Rabbi Eisman, I called the manager, and he says, look, he says, I can't do anything. The only person that can do is Mr. Hertzler. Mr. Hertzler owns the facility. He's the only one that can give you permission. So here's the issue. Mr. Hertzler is an old Hasidic Shayyid, and I highly doubt that he's going to give you permission to let a German shepherd into his assisted living. However, HaKadosh Baruch Hu runs the world. And it turns out that Mr. Herzl, who rarely ever left Florida, was coming to New York for a family simcha. And Rabbi Eisman was able to arrange a face-to-face -face meeting with him on that Sunday evening coming up. And when they arrived at the house where, where Mr. Herzl was staying in Borough Park, he said, I have to tell you my, my ex expectations for success were not very high. Mr. Herzl spoke Yiddish, really not English. He was a chassid shayid. And when I shook the hands of Rabbi Herzl, I said, hello, I couldn't help but notice on his forearm right over here, the numbers, the blue numbers from the concentration camp. And I asked myself, what are the chances that a 95-year-old survivor, a chassid shayid from the Holocaust, is going to allow a dog in his facility Nevertheless, I was already there and I had to give him my plea on behalf of my congregant, Bernie. We sat down and he gave me a, a glass of tea and some kokish cake and we began schmoozing and I explained the situation about Bernie, loss of his wife, all alone by himself, the German shepherd Oakley being his companion for the last number of, number of years since his wife passed away. And the, the dread that he had of not being able to come with his dog Oakley into this assisted living. So Mr. Herzl listened. And then after I plead, I pleaded on behalf of Bernie, he said over the following Pasik, Lo yechratz kelev A dog will not let out a growl against the Jewish people, which is a Pasik that comes from Sefer Shmois, when the Jewish people were leaving Mitzrayim, there wasn't a single dog that was growling or making a noise that we were able to leave in peace. So Rabbi Eisman was wondering, why in the world is Mr. Herzler saying this Pasuk? Maybe he didn't understand what I was saying. So I repeated it, what I was asking for, and he repeated the Pasuk again. And then he looked at me with a smile and he said the following, I've been waiting for you to come for 78 years. Of course, your friend can bring his dog. And in fact, I'll pay for the dog's needs, or I'll pay for everything. So I must have looked very confused and perplexed, and Mr. Herzl began to explain. It was 1945. It was the end of the war. The Nazis were evacuating the lager, the concentration camp. And I knew that the Russians were just days away from arriving. So I decided to hide under the barracks in a crawl space. And the Nazis took their dogs, their German shepherd dogs, to sniff out any Jews. Now the way that it worked, if the dog smelled the Jew, it began barking. And I'm lying there underneath the bed, under the barracks. And the dogs are bursting through the, 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 the room. And they're going from place to place, smelling and smelling and smelling. And I was repeating again and again and again, davening in my heart the Pasik. And to all the Jewish people, there was not a dog that let out a growl. He said to my amazement, the dog passed through exactly where I was, so close I could smell the breath of the dog, but the dog made no sound, and it just kept moving past. It was then that I made a promise to HaKadosh Baruch Hu, 
that just as Hashem paid back the dogs for not barking by Yitzis Mitzrayim, and the payback was, as the Torah says later on, that when a person has a tray for an animal that they cannot eat, they throw the remnants of the dogs in the fields, Hashem was paying them back for being silent when the Jews left Mitzrayim. I decided that I will pay back a German shepherd for not barking at the time of my own personal Yitzhiyas Mitzrayim. And finally, the day that I've been waiting for has arrived. Tell your friend that he in Oakley will be my honored guests. Said Rabbi Eisenman, I stood there stunned and speechless. And Mr. Hertzler took another piece of Kokish cake and put it on my plate. And then with simply said to me, you thought you came to ask me a favor. However, the opposite is true. Hashem sent you here to allow me to pay back an, a neder, a vow that I made 78 years ago. So let's make a l'chaim together to thank Hashem for all of His kindness. If you pour out your heart to the Rebbe Nishalom, and in those moments when it seems hopeless, you ask HaKadosh Baruch help me, and you trust in Hashem and only in Hashem, HaKadosh Baruch Hu is going to take care of you. So much so that a 95-year-old survivor of the Holocaust, 78 years later, HaKadosh Baruch Hu sent him a German shepherd right up to his front door to repay the debt that he owed because of those heartfelt feelings of pouring his heart and trusting in HaKadosh Baruch Hu when he needed it most. May we be zeicha im yetz Hashem to see HaKadosh Baruch Hu in our lives. Mechase, He is our refuge. He is our shield. He is our source of comfort. And even when we see things that are going on that are hard to understand, don't throw them away. Utilize them as a way to get closer and closer to the Rebbein Shalom, to buckle down on our Emunah and Abitachin, to bring ourselves closer to Hashem. And in that Zuchos, we'll trust in Hashem Bechol Ace all of the time. And the more that we trust, the more that we see, the more that we realize, the closer we're going to be to Hashem Bechol Ace all of the time. Have a faith in Purim to everyone. May we be zeichet to daven from the depths of our hearts. This very special day of tefillah, of prayer on Purim. Don't waste the day running around only delivering shalach manais. Make sure you set aside precious time to daven and say tehillim to HaKadosh Baruch Hu and pour it out whatever you need. May HaKadosh Baruch Hu listen to you and in that schus may all of your tefillahs be answered. I pray the him poem, everyone. Amen. Thank you, Rabbi. Thank you, Rabbi. You're welcome. Amen. Amen. Call to.